11, 10, 9. And we have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Chris Hadfield didn't go on that mission. He stayed in his kitchen and watched it on TV like everyone else. But Hadfield will be going into space. He's known that since he was nine years old. I channeled it all to go for this job. I, I spent all my life qualifying for this job or what I thought the qualifications were going to be for this job. I'd like to welcome you here to the Johnson Space Center. In July of last year, Chris Hadfield qualified and became one of NASA's elite astronaut trainees. No hitchhikers in this group. Hadfield and his colleagues in Houston, Texas will walk, work, and live in space. They are the people who will be trying to figure out how the human body reacts to the long duration aspects of flight. Their names will be added to the list of those who went before. The Johnson Space Center is a monument to those pioneers. Sometimes it's hard for 34-year-old Hadfield to believe he is in the same league as those who manned that first shuttle. To show up here and be assigned an office and sit there with John Young over at the other desk doing his stuff and me sitting there trying to figure out what my stuff is I'm supposed to be doing, it was, it was quite a, an amazing transition. It took some getting used to. In all the years... Helena Hadfield has listened to Chris's dreams since she was 16. After 12 years of marriage, she knows this is where her husband belongs. There's people in the office that he works with that he comes home and says, this person is, I mean, he's a this and he's a that, and he does this well and he came first in this. And, and he'll say, he's so incredibly brilliant. And I'll look at him and I'll, I'll think to myself, what are you thinking of? You know, you've done first in this and you've done this, but he, he's very modest in himself. He'll look at other people and say, wow, that person is incredible. And yet, he, they're the same. You're yeah. proud of him. Of course. You know, he's, uh, he's a great guy. And then Mach VI again will be dark. And he's not a bad aeronautical engineer. And it'll give us the same sort of contrast between tapes. NASA asked Hadfield to redesign the mechanical systems in the cockpit of the $2 billion shuttle, well, making all those instruments easier to read. And we're going to make it somewhere in between these two, is that right? Somewhere in between those two, right. That should be fine. The design suggestions Hadfield is making in this simulator will guide pilots on future missions. For Hadfield, that's pretty exciting, but not half as much as the anticipation of his first blast off. It fundamentally excites me to go and do that kind of thing. It is a, it's a visceral, deep-seated thrill, and it's what I want to do. It, 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 uh, it's, what I, it's what I dreamed about for so long. That dream began one summer night in 1969 on a farm in Milton, Ontario. Nine-year-old Chris Hadfield watched with the rest of the world as Neil Armstrong brought the notion of space closer to home. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. I was sitting, you know, watching Neil Armstrong step on the moon with my family, and everybody was very exciting and lots of hype. And then walking back that night across the grove to my folks' cottage, and it was a moonlit night, and I remember thinking real quietly at that time, but deciding to myself that that's what I would like to do. I wanted to be an astronaut. Flying was in the family genes. Chris's dad, Roger, used to fly stunt planes. Eventually, both of Chris's brothers, Philip and David, would join their father flying for Air Canada. What is it about this family and flying? Well, of course, when the uh, kids were small, uh, daddy was synonymous with, with flying. Yeah, well, and, uh, David, David, when he was a baby, he looked up and he said, Daddy, and he thought, he thought he was taught that Daddy was up there, but he thought that was the name of the machine that was up there. So. <laughs> Daddy. So. Daddy and airplane was synonymous. <laughs> that time there goes Daddy. That was that goes light, Daddy. light airplanes around the farm. <laughs> you know him better than anybody. How would you describe your boy? Oh, my. Um, a very capable human being. Extremely capable human being. Folks, don't get mushy on me. <laughs> no, that's not mushy. That's the way he was. Very strong, uh, very determined. He planned it all out from the beginning. 
First, he joined the Air Cadets and won a glider pilot scholarship. He was 15. Then he joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1978 and two years later graduated from the Royal Military College in Kingston with honours in mechanical engineering. Chris Hadfield knew where he was going. I whispered it at the beginning. You know, I said it very quietly then because it was, uh, it was not conceivable for a Canadian to do that kind of thing and to, to have the audacity to say that I would do that kind of thing just, you know, seemed ridiculous. And then just louder and louder over time, I said, well, I'd kind of like to be an astronaut when anybody asked me. To pass that test, Hadfield had to be the best. He was. Since graduating from test pilot school in 1980, Chris Hadfield's resume is full of the right stuff. I don't know what I expected, but I really did expect more awards and plaques and photographs. He's got them. <laughs> but they're not all over the house. No, they're up in my office. <laughs> Shouldn't be up in my office. This is the first place he's ever been allowed to have anything up. But uh, uh, Why? I don't know. I just, I hate I love me walls. I, I just think I love me walls are the ultimate ego thing. And Chris has never had a big ego. And, you know, despite all the successes he's had, he's really always been a down-to-earth guy. This astronaut is not only great in the kitchen, he also tucks in the three kids every night. You guys can sing if you like. The suns came from across the land to help them through. And last night in the kitchen was the Mrs. Dream come true. Though he knows what he's doing, it doesn't make sense to him. He'll never reap all that he's sown. They stand to watch the colors hammer fall. The family has moved eight times in ten years to accommodate Hadfield's career plans. His father once tried to talk Chris into a more stable lifestyle flying with Air Canada. Flying was great, and I would have been happy with flying, but this is even better. So why not? Why not keep trying? Why not uh, chase after your ultimate dream? Mode, well, for one thing, the suit gets really hot, and they expect you to bail out at 18,000 feet in an emergency. You think they pay you well? No one becomes an astronaut for the money. It's nobody gets rich being an astronaut. W what's the ballpark? It's about uh, 50 or 60 thousand dollars or something total. So gross before taxes. That's it. That's it. That's all. You're telling me they don't throw in a few extra bucks for you to be shot up into space? No, they don't. There's no, uh, there's no astronaut classification or anything. I'm just a pilot in the Canadian Air Force administratively. But I, money's never motivated me. That's not, that's not what excites me. But this advertisement did excite him. In January of 92, the Canadian Space Agency placed astronaut wanted ads in Canadian newspapers. 5,300 wannabes applied. 50 were invited for interviews. Why do you want to become an astronaut? To create new knowledge or and do research. I love to learn about different areas of science. I remember seeing Saturn's rings through a toy telescope for the first time. Do you remember what you said? Oh, I, I, I said, uh, because I think I'd be good at it. Hey, yeah. I'd hire you. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. This was the ultimate test. Body and soul under a microscope. Only the fittest would survive the final cut. One out of five applicants was eliminated for medical reasons. For a while, it looked as if Chris Hadfield would be one of them. A computer error indicated he had a hole in his heart, and for a week before the mistake was detected, he lived a nightmare. Not only am I not going to be an astronaut, I'm going to need open heart surgery, and I'm not going to be able to fly jets anymore when I leave here. So, so that was the biggest uh, problem that I dealt with. But Chris was in great shape. In June of 1992, he and the three other winners were paraded before the world at ceremonies in Ottawa. His new astronaut colleagues would go on to train at the Canadian Space Agency facilities in Saint-Hubert, Quebec. 
three days later, NASA picked Hadfield to train next to Mark Garneau as Canada's first mission specialists. Major Hadfield, his wife Helena, and their three children were off to Houston. How did the news come that he made it? Oh, well, we were in our... <laughs> this is bizarre. We were in our... They said the calls are going to come at 1 o'clock. And a couple of minutes after that, the call came, and on the phone, of course, he's, he's yes and yes. And I can tell by his face that, that it's good news. Um, but, of course, he's not. Meanwhile, I'm, like, doing cartwheels around the kitchen and, and, and almost peeing on the floor <laughs> just because it was, I was so excited. And Chris was, oh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and and we're, we're saying, come on. But, of course, that's just talking, if, uh, talking on the telephone afterwards. He was pretty happy. He was? Yeah. He let loose? <laughs> well, a little bit. As much as, as much as he can let loose, yeah, he does. So what he, did he do? He smiled a lot. <laughs> Do you have an idea how long it'll be before you go? Um, in my group of 24 astronauts, the first two have just been assigned. And, but you have uh, no idea yet? Me personally, no. You sort of get assigned in a crew rotation. So and it could be what, one year, five years? I would expect to go within two or three years for sure, yeah. So maybe sooner. Be great. <sighs> this is the mid-deck. This is basically the living room and the sleeping room as well. Everybody sleeps here? Uh, we sleep all over the place. People upstairs, downstairs. Some will sleep in the airlock. My super technical question, what has confounded me for a long time. Where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? Where's well, the we'll show you the bathroom. mundane question. <laughs> this is the bathroom. We call it the WCS or, uh, what is that, waste control system, I guess? Waste collection system? It's in here. This is just a regular toilet like an outhouse. Uh, for urine collection, we need a urine collection tube, and that comes up, and everybody has their own individual adapter. Men and women oh, have a different type of adapter, and they're stored up in here. And you just uh, turn on. It, it works. Of course, there's no gravity to pull everything away from your body, so it just works with airflow, and it generates suction with turbines, so there's always enough airflow and, oh. to pull things away from you. But it's, it may sound silly and distasteful, but it's really important because if any matter that's coming out of your body gets into the atmosphere here, it's going to float around and you're going to breathe it or, you know, get it in your eye or you're going to ingest it somehow and people can get very sick very quickly. So that's where it's done. I can't reach. Okay. Oh. This it's easier in zero G. Is it? Yeah. Ironically, the only time this top test pilot gets to sit in the driver's seat of this shuttle is during training. Where do you sit? Where will your seat be? Uh, it, though that's where the commander sits, and this is where the pilot sits. I won't be in either of these two. I'll be in one of the other possible six seats on board. But first and foremost, you are, and you always have been, a pilot. Yeah. Doesn't there, isn't there a part of you that says, I want to put the key in the ignition? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, there's a part of me wants to get into that seat right now and go to orbit, but... Uh, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages. It would be great to fly the shuttle, but the pilot and the commander don't get to go outside and do spacewalks. And as a Canadian, I would never be commanding the American space shuttle, naturally, so it doesn't make sense for me to train for that seat. It makes more sense for me to train to run the manipulator arm, go out and do spacewalks, prepare to build space station that, that Canada's contributing to. Out to the shot. Out to the shot. Four mornings a week, Hadfield studies Russian, sometimes with fellow astronaut Katie Coleman. Well, you're way better at these than I am. It's because they're my cards. <laughs> In NASA's heyday, the Russians were the enemy. Now they're scheduled to partner future space projects. A lot of things have changed. There have been a, a lot of space setbacks, starting with the Challenger disaster that killed seven people. There's equipment that's been lost up in space. It, it's, it's not the same as when you were nine years old. Nothing's the same as when you were nine years old, though. And when the space program was new, it was, it was Buck Rogers. That whole honeymoon is over. And as a result, it, it's not as interesting, and so naturally people want to focus on the newsworthy events, which are still when something blows up or when a lot of money uh, doesn't buy what it was supposed to have bought. And so that's what we have to deal with. I would imagine you were probably confronted with the question, is it worth it going into space? It costs a lot of money, and there isn't a lot of money to go around these days. The way I see life is it's, it's very important to take care of the problems of today but it's also just as important to deal with the problems of tomorrow. You have to 
have a plan for the future. And the space agency and the space research that we do is, is one of those pivotal, fundamental driving wedges that pushes the frontiers back. And if we stop that, because our problems of today look overpowering, then we'll just stop moving forward. Playing catch in a weightless state is all part of the NASA training. The lessons here are not so different from those Hadfield learned in a fighter jet. Control over his environment, control over his fear. Scared's bad. <laughs> it's out of control. Yeah, scared's out of control. Yeah. You are very much a man in control. I, I don't know. I guess from the outside I look very much like I'm in control, but uh, I'm just as confused about life in general and the reason we're all here as anybody else. Existential angst has never stopped Chris Hadfield. He wants to leave his mark on the world, and he's been luckier than most. He is about to do what he's dreamed of since he was nine years old.